so you've you've painted a lot of a lot of different fish. You you grow as an artist every time. You, know, you say that it's sort of the artist's curse that you you've never done your best work because you you do a work and you learn so much that you you feel like you could immediately go back and do it better. Um, does that happen to you? And and if so, do you always like the the work that you've done most recently, or do you have some old favorites? Well, in in general, um, I'll, I'll like stuff while I'm doing it because I like doing it. But uh, over mm -hmm. time, I start to pick it apart. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very glad to sell it, so I don't have to look at it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I have some favorites. I, I you know, it's it, you you grow in uh, fits and starts. You don't always. It's not always a uh, a straight line. Sometimes mm -hmm. when you go to work on a painting, sometimes you feel like, oh my gosh, I can't even do anything today. I'm not going to do anything today. Uh, other days you feel like, wow, you're really on it. And then the other thing about mm -hmm. painting that's uh, that 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 you learn from is what they I call happy accidents or mistakes. Things happen as you go, and you go, wow, that looks good. I didn't intend to do it. No one else mm -hmm. know that. Boy, that looks good. And then you try to remember what you did and recreate it. So. Um, yeah, I'm, 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 in general, I think most uh, decent artists are always dissatisfied and trying to get better. But, you know, sometimes you hit, hit a real high note and you're, and, and you're very pleased. You're like, wow, I didn't know I could do that. But, but most of the time, you know, you're, you're always striving to get better. It's, it's natural. Could you elaborate on the larger paintings, um, some the 12 footers, for instance, mm -hmm. um, or sorry, the 12, 12 to 24 inch sizes? Um, do you then enlarge them after that? Well, um, I buy rolls of watercolor paper. I mean, first of all, I buy sheets. I, I, I work on 22 by 30. I work on 29 uh, by 41. And I work on 40 by 60. Those are standard art, arches watercolor paper sizes that I, I work on. And they each have a price point that, that uh, is, stays pretty consistent. For the larger pieces, you have to buy a roll. And I buy the arches roll. And um, it's... I think it's uh, 48 inches tall, and it's as long as you want to make it. So I've made plywood uh, tables that I put on standing horses. I work horizontally, so I have to project my images with a opaque projector, or now I use actually a, an Epson digital projector. I do my drawings uh, on about an 18 inch format. I scan it. Mm -hmm. I make it a JPEG and I put it into the Epson projector and I project it onto the paper, which is, uh, you know, I, I, I put it against the wall, I project it onto the paper and I trace it. Then um, I wet the, the, the piece of paper in the tub and I put it on a piece of gator board and I tape it down with uh, strapping tape or, or, or packing tape, the, the brown craft paper tape, and I let it dry. That's called sizing. That way, when I work on it, it doesn't buckle and go all over the place. So I have a nice flat sheet to work on. Um, and then I do my technique. Unfortunately, I have to work horizontally for my technique. Uh, I can't work vertically like a classic uh, watercolorist. It's, it's, it's labor intensive, but um, I still do my technique, uh, no matter how large it is, with the frisket, building it up. And then, um, you know, eventually just uh, rubbing it off and smoothing it out and adding details. So uh, big pieces take a long time and uh, mm -hmm. smaller pieces, not so much time. But here's the interesting thing. If I'm doing sharks or whales or animals that don't have a, a, a lot of detail, it, uh, sometimes I can do a, a, a five or eight foot shark and the same time it might take me to do a 20 by 30 tropical fish with a whole bunch of scales. So um, it's, it's, it's time-wise, it's, it's interesting. It's not always what you expect. But if I'm doing something like the tarpon piece that I showed earlier or the sailfish piece with lots and lots of detail and lots of fish, it, it, that, 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 those can take months. I understand you're quite a fisherman. Do you do catch and release? Yes, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a third generation fly fisherman uh, and I tie my own flies and I am catch and release to a certain point. Um, I understand mortality rates with catch and release with, with trout can be, it's a controversy. Some people say it's 3% if you know how to handle the fish. Other people say it's up to 30%. I'm not a, a headhunter or a trophy, a head count 
you know, type of trophy hunter type uh, fly fisherman. I, I don't like to catch more than a dozen fish a day. I just don't see the point in it. I quit often after two or three or four fish. That's just me. I tend to think that mortality rates are probably pretty high. Likewise, in certain rivers and streams where I think that the fish could get a little larger if some of them were cold and it's not a catch and release only, there's nothing wrong with taking some home for the frying pan. Um, mm -hmm. It all depends on the, the environment. If, if the trout are having a good time or a, a hard time, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a lot of predation from people or minks or otters or whatever, I'll leave them alone. But if there's an abundance of fish and you can see that they're on the smaller side, it helps to cull them because then there'll be some bigger fish for other people to catch. So it depends. I do like to catch and keep, but mostly I practice uh, catch and release. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Future Frogmen conversation series. Please check out our website at www.futurefrogmen.org.